Okay, please take your seats. We're going to start. I want to remind everybody that you must be wearing your badges at all times for security reasons. They will stop you if you're not. And please, please make sure to keep them and bring them back with you tomorrow. It's very important that you bring your badges back with you tomorrow morning. I hope everybody enjoyed lunch. And now we will begin our afternoon session. I am very honored to introduce to you, to actually reintroduce to you, Commander Richard Walton. He is the former head of the London Metropolitan Police Services Counterterrorism Command and the current director of Counterterrorism Global LTD. Mr. Walton has many years of experience delivering successful counterterrorism and counter extremism strategies within a rule of law framework. He has also worked internationally across the security sector delivering rule of law, stabilization, and capacity building in fragile conflict affected states. Please welcome Commander Richard Walton. Uh, well, good afternoon to you all. Um, it really doesn't feel like 9-11 uh, was 15 years ago. It uh, feels a lot closer than that. Um, and we, as we discuss an increasing global th threat that's frankly affecting every country in the world now, I'm acutely aware that Israel has experienced more terrorist attacks than most. And when I last looked, it was 3,500 killed and over 14,000 injured. Uh, I think that it's worth saying that Shirat Hadin's greatest strength has to be its moral foundation, which was mentioned earlier on. Uh, you represent the largely powerless victims of terrorism, uh, some of whom I've met over the years. Like young Owen Richards, here with his brother Joel a day before, his brother his uncle and his grandfather were all assassinated in front of him by an ISIS terrorist who killed 38 holidaymakers last year in 30 minutes on a beach in Tunisia. And I think if I'm being honest with this audience, uh, this is the first time in my career of 30 years I'd ever broken down in front of, in front of anybody. But uh, it was a very moving experience meeting this young lad returning back from Tunisia after he'd been repatriated. Uh, after he'd been through that experience, totally traumatized and, and barely able to speak. So we must never forget the families uh, of terrorist attacks. And too close? Closer, okay. And that is surely why we're all here. So I'm gonna break up my talk into three sections. Um, firstly, I want to give you a perspective on the global terrorist threat we're facing with a particular emphasis on the surge in terrorist attacks across Europe. And secondly, I then want to talk about the United Kingdom's uh, counterterrorism model, um, the rule of law model that's been developed uh, over many, many decades, uh, but not necessarily adapted and uh, adopted by other European countries. And finally, I want to give you my thoughts on the trends we're likely to see in the next few years. And I'm afraid I don't think there's much good news there uh, either. But first to the threat we face. Um, the nations of the world are collectively and individually facing an enduring global networked threat, the likes of which the world has not previously seen, and which is unlikely to diminish any time soon. Ungoverned spaces, referred to by our intelligence agencies as the ink spots of the world, are providing the petri dishes for the growth of this terrorism. But the culture, the infectious virus, the ideologies of radical, violent Islam, mostly, but others too, are being spread by charismatic vocal leaders around the world, and as we've already discussed and heard so, uh, so well, by social media. 
So thanks to the US-led coalition on ISIS, it will soon lose control of Raqqa and Mosul. Gosh. But Islamic terrorism is likely to remain strong globally because adherents to the ideology around the world are definitely growing, not diminishing. The virus is spreading and is not contained. The war against the physical caliphate of ISIS will undoubtedly be won soon. But the war against the virtual caliphate, the ideology, is still being lost. Terrorism and extremism are in the ascendancy globally. In the past year alone, ISIS has successfully directed, enabled, or inspired over 100 terrorist attacks in over 20 countries. And it's a formidable and depressing record. ISIS even boasted of a death toll of 5,200 during Ramadan on social media. And that did not include the 80 victims, largely women and children, killed in the Nice attack uh, uh, sometime a few days afterwards. In the past 10 days, and barely reported, frankly, in Europe, we've seen a terrorist plot disrupted in France and an individual charged in the UK with planning terrorism. There have been 15 arrests in France, UK, and Germany in the last two weeks, including, interestingly, five women, alongside Minnesota, New York, New Jersey. The disrupted plot in France was an attempt to bomb Christians attending the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. So the Islamic terrorist threat we are facing is far from random. And as unpalatable as it is to say, we need to remind ourselves constantly that those leaders responsible for this Islamic terror are actually calculating visionaries and strategists. The leadership of ISIS will continue to pursue attacks against the world in order to destabilize and incite sectarian divisions between Sunni and Shia and Muslims and Jews and Christians. The leaders of other terrorist groups in the Middle East may have different objectives, but they are equally strategic and visionary and use the same methods, the targeting of civilians in terrorist attacks. And you might ask, is our response as strategic and visionary? When al-Baghdadi announced the creation of the caliphate just two years ago in June 2014, he knew he was creating Islamic history. And his accompanying communication strategy enticed over 30,000 foreign nationals from at least 86 countries to join an army of terrorists, as well as 6,000 nationals from Europe and thousands more from Arab states. Israel and America can draw some comfort from the fact that relatively few of the nationals left who joined the caliphate uh, sorry, very few of the nationals left to join the caliphate from those two countries. The official count being a mere 150 from the United States and 40 to 50 from Israel. Compare that to 1,700 from France, almost 1,000 from the UK, and 760 from Germany. Now, attracting numbers on this scale was a masterclass in brand and marketing. So even when Raqqa falls, there will be an ISIS alumni across the world for decades to come. And the foreign fighter threat has been a complete game changer for Europe, struggling to face a challenge it is ill-equipped to deal with. In the past year, there have been over a thousand arrests across the countries of the EU for terrorist-related offenses, with court proceedings concluded in relation to over 500 individuals. you're now significantly less safe in Paris than Jerusalem or New York. In 2015, 151 people died in terrorist attacks in Europe, with 360 injured. In Israel, 83 killed and 251 injured. In Europe, we used to know that terrorism was rare and usually in a far and away place. 
we now know it's no longer rare and that it could, might just happen here. And the effect of the Paris and Brussels attacks on the psyche of Londoners and citizens of other European cities cannot be underestimated. The fear of terrorism is regrettably now rational, not irrational. ISIS has now successfully exploited weaknesses across borders in Europe, discontented, isolated Muslim communities, and fractured intelligence agencies that do not talk to one another, let alone share intelligence. And as we've heard, above all else, ISIS has learned the art of selling the brand and inspiring action through sophisticated marketing and advertising. I agree entirely that social media is having a force multiplier effect on the terrorist threat. It is providing the fuel on the fire of terrorism, the poison for extremism, and the means for terrorists to control and brainwash the innocent, the vulnerable, and the mentally ill across the world. Live streaming, which wasn't mentioned interestingly in the last discussion, live streaming will increasingly be used to show terrorists in action like some kind of virtual reality show. And social media has also placed a turbocharge on the fear that terrorists engender. Terrorists can now goad and taunt world leaders with a one-line Twitter post, knowing that their words, words will then be broadcast across the world with impunity. And how long is it before Baghdadi claims that the attacks in America over the last few days were revenge for the, uh, for the uh, strike on Adnani, uh, the uh, ISIS head of external operations killed in a drone strike a week or so ago? So I'm a really strong supporter of the courage that Shirat Hadin has shown filing lawsuits against those who control our social media platforms. As we've heard last month, Twitter suspended 235,000 accounts that it said were promoting terrorism. And a further 125,000 ISIS sites were taken down in February. But one has to ask the question, how is it that these 300,000 accounts were allowed to be created in the first place? And as we've heard again, great minds have come up with new algorithms, new robust hashing technologies to block content and software that automates the taking down of terrorist sites. It's a welcome departure from where we were just a few years ago, but it is, in my view, too little, too late. In 2005, I set up an internet referral unit that was the first to do takedown of illegal terrorist material. Interestingly, when we established it, it was not unusual to get requests from US law enforcement asking us to take down sites that they were unable to take down owing to the American Constitution. It was also a revelation to discover that I had more detectives working on the unit doing takedowns than Google had, who at that point never admitted actually, and I still think it's the same today, actually how many people they employ in these social media doing this, this sort of work. I don't think it's officially known. So you are absolutely right to put the spotlight on social media, because if you don't, who will? And I thought Micah Avney's powerful testimony in the last session was telling. And he left us with two questions. One was relating to the American Constitution. Should it be changed or can it be changed? And the second was, is the right to freedom of, freedom of speech, is it an absolute right? And I think both those two questions are worth mulling on over the next two days. And we should expect, regardless of the war in Syria, the threat will remain global, potentially affecting every and any country in the world. To endure beyond the existence of the physical caliphate and for the virtual caliphate to emerge. And terrorist organizations closer to home for Israel, Hamas and Hezbollah, will, I fear, draw encouragement and perhaps inspiration from the methodologies used by the Islamic State learning from the ISIS masterclass on how to recruit terrorists and how to incite terrorism through the vehicle of social media. So that is the terrorist threat that we currently face. A proliferation of terrorist groups globally directing, enabling, and now also inspiring through social media terrorism around the world. That is the challenge we face. Now what should our strategy be to defeat it? 
No country is immune to this threat, and every country now needs a comprehensive counterterrorism and counterterrorism and counter-extremism strategy to suppress and contain this threat. Terrorism is now a threat to all states. Even the Ivory Coast experienced a dreadful terrorist attack earlier this year when an ISIS-inspired gunman killed 16 people on one of its beaches. But the lenses through which countries view terrorism are actually not the same. The strengths and weaknesses of counterterrorism structures are very different. In fact, as I'm learning, no two countries do it the same way. And this presents real opportunities for terrorist groups. The world is simply not united on how this threat should be tackled. Now, since 9-11, the UK has disrupted, on average, one major terrorist plot per year. But over the last two years, we have disrupted at least eight serious attack plots by ISIS and Al-Qaeda, as many as France has experienced. The UK has made more terrorist arrests than at any time in its history, convicted more than ever before, and conducted more live covert operations against Islamic extremists than ever before. And we do differ in Great Britain fundamentally from our European partners, who have experienced some of the most horrific terrorist attacks over the past year in Paris, Brussels and Nice. Both France and Belgium have adopted the language of war when faced with terrorist attacks in their homelands and have flooded their streets with patrolling soldiers. But this approach, in my view, is a costly mistake. Away from the battlefields of Syria and Iraq, terrorism is first and foremost a crime of murder as well as a threat to national security. And it doesn't help when the head of Europol refers to the terrorists that committed the Paris attacks as militants. By doing so, he is pandering to political correctness and inadvertently legitimizing the actions of murderers. We have in the UK a good news story to tell of the success of fighting the terrorist threat through the rule of law. There's just been one successful Islamic terrorist fatality in the UK in the past 11 years since 7 7 in 2005. And that was the attack on the soldier, Drummer Lee Rigby who was beheaded in London Street. Despite the severe threat over this period, one single terrorist attack at home. But this has not been by chance, and there are underlying reasons why the UK is now starting to look like an outlier when compared to many other countries, and European countries in particular. We learned during the Irish terrorist campaigns that you only win against terrorism through good intelligence and if your intelligence agencies, military, and police are genuinely joined up and working together. Not just talking, but sitting alongside one another in the same control rooms in a truly integrated way, with integrated systems, policies, and practices. And the United States learned this lesson after 9-11 and created the Joint Terrorism Task Forces, which have played such a significant part in reducing the threat of terrorism at home since. So our Counterterrorism Command at New Scotland Yard works hand in glove with our intelligence agencies, MI5 and MI6, and our special forces, SAS and SBS. There are very few silos left in the British counterterrorism machine, no noticeable divisions. There is complete trust between counterterrorism police officers and their intelligence agency counterparts. There is a presumption of sharing intelligence. You also win if you operate within the rule of law and are compliant with human rights law. You win when you convict terrorists in a court of law and when you can present credible evidence in a clinical manner, even if it takes time, even decades. And when you convict, you win the, win the trust of your population, including your Muslim population. But many countries are struggling with these simple concepts. A month ago, the French Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry into the Paris attacks stated that French intelligence had failed and concluded that the six French intelligence agencies needed to be overhauled and merged into a single agency directly under the Prime Minister's authority. The chair of the committee said, 
Clearly, Europe is not up to the task in the fight against terrorism. He also criticised the lack of collaboration between France and Belgium. Now, like the UK, America has two major advantages over European countries facing down this terrorist threat. The United States is surrounded by sea and retains control of its borders. There is already good collaboration and co-location between FBI and state police forces under the JTTF arrangements. But the UK has two other advantages that many other countries do not have. Firearms are extremely rare and difficult to get hold of, and we have a mature CVE, or as we would say, prevent strategy embedded in law. Sadly, at the moment, Europe, by contrast, has much less control over its borders, is awash with firearms, and riven with division between its police counterterrorism agencies and between its police and its intelligence agencies. And compounding all of this is a lack of engagement with Muslim communities across some European countries and no clear CVE or prevent strategy dealing with radicalization and counter-narratives. And it will take many years for some countries to fix these issues. They are not quick fixes. Now, there are three areas where we in the UK are trying to improve that you might find interesting at this juncture. These are, firstly, uplifting our overseas counterterrorism strategy, secondly, using social media as evidence, and thirdly, developing our counter to violent extremism strategy. Now to the first, uplifting our overseas strategy. I mentioned earlier that there had been just one fatality from Islamic terrorism in the past 11 years in the UK. But of course, I didn't mention that 51 British uh, citizens have been killed in terrorist attacks overseas in the same time period. And of course, 38, 30 were killed in 28 minutes, as I said, on the beach in Tunisia. Owen's father, uh, sorry, a brother, uncle, and grandfather, three of them. Like the British, Americans and Israelis are arguably now more vulnerable to terrorism overseas. The Tunisia attack was a wake-up call to the UK counterterrorism machine. We realized that we'd created, to a large extent, a hostile environment for terrorism at home, but we were doing little or too little to build the capabilities of counterterrorism infrastructures in countries where British nationals were going on holiday. Tunisia, Turkey, Egypt, the most prominent. And what was our international law enforcement counterterrorism strategy? It was only following the Tunisia attack that we realized that the Tunisian National Police had no capability to digitally retrieve vital threat intelligence and evidence from phones and laptops seized. They basically had no digital media exploitation capability, which is crucial and critical in every modern day police terrorist investigation. So the UK is uplifting its overseas counterterrorism strategy, which includes training in key areas and doubling to 50 the number of counterterrorism police detectives working overseas. We're trying to export the British model of counterterrorism, sound uh, terrorism legislation, effective integrated intelligence agencies, coupled with highly skilled police officers who can convert intelligence into evidence and fight terrorism through the rule of law. An overseas CT strategy can also address other opportunities for gathering evidence abroad against suspects at home. And let me give you uh, an example. Last year, catching up, last year British police convicted a British terrorist, a British terrorist called Sadar for making improvised explosive devices that blew up an American army patrol in Iraq, killing Sergeant Randy Johnson of the 2nd Cavalry Regiment. Sadar had left the UK eight years previously to join a terrorist group who were targeting US patrols in Iraq. After making many IEDs that were used to attack US patrols, he subsequently returned to the UK. And in the intervening years, he reinvented himself back in London as a London black cab driver, a London cabbie. So eight years after this terrorist attack, we solved the case using forensic and circumstantial evidence 
that had been recovered painstakingly by the US military and taken back to the forensic lab in Virginia. The evidence placed Sardar in the team of bomb makers in Western Baghdad. We then demonstrated that this was an act of terrorism, not an act of war. Sardar was a British citizen who had committed a crime overseas and murder is one of a small number of offenses that are extraterritorial. The evidence was irrefutable. Using evidence from Iraq and America, we convicted a British citizen in London of committing an act of terrorism eight years previously in a war zone far away. And he was sentenced to 38 years imprisonment. Battlefield digital exploitation is now a key part of our international strategy. Let me now turn to social media, the second area we're looking to improve upon. We need to start seeing social media as a forensic opportunity, as well as a force multiplier on terrorism. In 2014, a man called Imran Khawaja left his home in West London to join a British ISIS cell in Syria. The cell was called Rabat al-Tahid, which translates as Banner of God, a mouthpiece for British foreign fighters from London that were fighting in support of Islamic State. This group encouraged British citizens to join the Syrian war and openly, blatantly, posted video messages and images on social media encouraging British citizens to join ISIS as well as spreading Islamic extremist propaganda. We evidentially captured this material that showed, amongst other images, firearms, videos of executions, and a video of ISIS fighters displaying severed heads. One of the men in the videos was named as Abu al Britani, and this is him holding up a bag of Syrian heads of decapitated Syrian soldiers. After a few months, he faked his own death on social media, and he was reported on Instagram as being killed in battle. But in fact, he'd actually returned to the UK. And we stopped him coming through a seaport called Calais. We undertook a fast digital download of his phones and recovered vital digital forensic evidence. And a comprehensive review of open source material posted on social media sites was completed. And it was established that Abu al Britani was in fact Imran Khawaja, a known criminal from West London. Using images that Khawaja himself posted on social media, we were then able to match these were the images on his phones when he tried to get back into the country. He was effectively convicted by his own social media postings. Now let me mention the third and final area where I believe there may be some scope to improve your counterterrorism strategies, what I call upstream vulnerability. If a teacher in New York or Tel Aviv spotted a young Muslim teenager watching beheading videos on his phone, would he or she know what to do? Last year, as part of our prevent strategy, we legislated in the UK making it mandatory for certain statutory agencies to report to police any forms of extremism or suggestions of extremism that they may come across. It was pretty controversial legislation but amazingly has now resulted in 750 referrals to police per month across the country from teachers, social workers, and healthcare professionals. Many of these referrals are quickly dealt with, but a small number are leading to high priority, top end counterterrorism investigations. We're now tracking each and every one of the leads emanating from these referrals. And it's clear that this mandatory referral system is preventing terrorism further down the line. The spread of radicalization can be very rapid. So early intervention is crucial, and it will be the teachers that may spot the children most vulnerable to radicalization or extremist influences. This is about safeguarding the young and vulnerable from extremism in the same way that we undertake other forms of safeguarding from drugs and child abuse. It is about moving up the pitch and not relying on goal line defense. Let me illustrate this with an example from the UK. A girlfriend of a young teenage boy approached us concerned about the changes she had noticed in him. His name was Ziamani. 
An operation was started when information was received that the 17-year-old had recently converted to Islam with the result that his Facebook postings had suddenly become more radical. A search of his address discovered extremist literature which glorified the killing of Lee Rigby together with a suicide letter addressed to his parents. Age 17, he'd become radicalized in just 12 weeks through association with an organization called Al Majaroon in London who were prescribed. His Facebook postings went from normal teenage shots of himself in tourist sites in London to suddenly extremist ISIS postings in a matter of weeks. And just 12 weeks after conversion, following lengthy surveillance, he was arrested in possession of an ISIS flag, a large knife and a hammer on his way to behead an army cadet. He was sentenced to 22 years imprisonment. My point is that reporting of concern around extremism needs to be a legal obligation and the norm in our societies if we are to pick up the often subtle signs that are seen in schools, families, and mosques. Like drugs, extremism will always be with us. So we need to make our reporting mechanisms systematic and routine to be effective. So I commend mandatory referral from statutory agencies to you as a means of terrorist prevention. So let me conclude by saying that away from the battlefields, Terrorism is, I believe, fundamentally a police, not a military, business, undertaken by clever and sophisticated intelligence agencies working alongside a police counterterrorism machine that can present intelligence as evidence in a criminal court. And terrorism is best defeated through the rule of law. There's no better outcome, there's no better deterrence, and no better sanction than a lengthy prison sentence. And you retain, importantly, the confidence of the public. Now, there will be many challenges to this model of counterterrorism in the future, not least terrorists using more sophisticated encryption methodologies, and there are new challenges and trends emerging all the time. Finally, let me just say there are five trends that I think will feature in the next year, and I'm sorry, but they're not great trends, but I, I feel duty-bound to carry on the theme here. Um, the first trend, I believe, is that Owing to the impact of social media, we're going to see yet more inspired attacks, and we may well have done in the last few days, of course, carried out by teenagers, the mentally ill, and others. And I don't see anything in place uh, deterring or preventing this from carrying on its, on its trajectory. Secondly, we are likely to see more women who travel to Syria to be jihadi brides return as trained, hardened terrorists. And we will see them engaged in attack planning and plotting. And this is going to present, I believe, unique challenges to police and intelligence agencies not used to women terrorists. Thirdly, we will see increasing numbers of attacks on religious premises, in particular Shia, Jewish and Christian places of worship, and in Europe in particular. This will raise high levels of fear across religious communities as the attack on the priest in France demonstrated. Fourthly, we may see attacks that target children and the elderly, specifically in an attempt to shock the world. Sorry, I've gone ahead of myself there. Oh, yeah. ISIS issued a new publication this month called Rumayyah, in which it stressed that all non-Muslims are valid targets for jihadists, including businessmen, young adults, and the old man waiting in line to buy a sandwich. The directive is illustrated with a picture of a man at a British market stall selling fruit and, and flowers. And finally, we will also see a growing capability by terrorists in the cyber world. Cyber hacking by terrorist groups has been around for a while, but we're on the cusp of seeing cyber terrorism. And I do think it's inevitable. So we do need to start thinking now on uh, our prevention strategies on how to deter and prevent it. So I know that this audience of all audiences understands and takes seriously the nature of these threats and the closeness of the relationship between the UK, the US and Israel will be critical to combating these threats together. During my time as head of counterterrorism at Scotland Yard, I had regular dialogue with my colleagues and counterparts in the FBI, NYPD 
and intelligence agencies in Israel too, Shin Bet and Mossad. NGOs like Shirat Hadin have an important role also to play in tackling issues that governments find difficult to tackle. Using civil and international law to tackle those who support fund terrorism and those who provide platforms for it to thrive. It is always a pleasure to work closely with countries that share our values in the UK and long may that relationship continue. Thank you for listening. I think we've got a short session now to take some questions if you want to ask me any questions. And I think I'm going to do the... Yes. Commander, thank you very much. Uh, you spoke of the uh, successes in the UK in coordinating intelligence post 7-7. You talked, though, about the fractured intelligence agencies in the rest of the world. It appears that maybe uh, Paris and Brussels were evidence of lack of coordination of intelligence agencies. Are you seeing, are you encouraged now that there is more coordination, particularly in, within Europe and between Europe and America, in some of these intelligence uh, situations? Um, so there's certainly the intent. There's certainly the acknowledgement that that's what needs to happen. Um, but it takes years, not weeks and months, to achieve that extent, the, the collaboration that's required. So and I think particularly in France, they recognize this. I mean, the politicians are recognizing this, that you cannot fix this in, in a short time. So hence the sort of resorting to troops on the streets, because they know that fusing your intelligence agencies with your police agencies um, and better collaboration across Europe is going to take time. Um, but there's a will and intent to do that. It just will take years, not months. Um, here. Going together against ISIS. There's a mic right here, sir. What do you view as the biggest obstruction, political or otherwise, to the nations of the world who count for going against ISIS? Well, I think, if I might say, that the, the, the US-led coalition against ISIS has been already, I believe, a success story. To, to coalesce, I think, 60-odd countries against ISIS was a tremendous achievement by your Secretary of State. So I think um, you know, that was an achievement. Um, in terms of obstacles further down the track, um, people talk about collaboration between countries um, as being important. But actually, the biggest uh, problem at the moment is not actually a cross-country collaboration. It's the collaboration within countries between the police services and their intelligence agencies. Intelligence agencies weren't set up to do counterterrorism, and police agencies are not geared up to doing intelligence work. So you have to find a way of fusing those two endeavors together in one united effort. And we're just lucky, I suppose, or that we've, in the UK, have, um, we started that journey a lot earlier than most countries. Um, I mean, it started, it started in my career. It started. 20 odd years ago, but it was a, it really started properly after 7 7 in 2005. So we've had 11 years of, of achievement of co better collaboration within our country of our agencies. Um, America 9 11 was the was the um, was the, the, the if you like the game changer and the, the point in which um, it all changed. The commission report recommended better collaboration with the FBI, CIA, and, and other agencies um, and created the homeland, uh, etc. etc. So but the problem in Europe at the moment is, is, is one mostly of within the countries themselves. Um, the collaboration actually across countries is not too bad. Um, but if your own uh, CT machine is broken and not united and joined up, then you'll have intelligence falling between the cracks there. And it doesn't matter how good your collaboration is with your neighbors, um, uh, you know, the intelligence won't get shared. You mentioned that you had dialogue with uh, Google about YouTube videos and their ability to take them down. What has been their response, and, and what is the response time of taking them down? And what have the social, other social media companies' response been if you've dialogued with them with, with this kind of extremist content? Sure. Well, it's all moved a lot faster in the last couple of years. So, you know, when we started on this journey in the UK, as I said, we couldn't get anything taken down unless it was illegal in the UK. Um, now, obviously, there's a much more of a propensity to take stuff down, and there's a lot of, a lot of agencies from different countries recommending takedown of sites. But we're, as the last uh, panel, uh, I thought, eloquently articulated, um, you know, we are still a long way from 
you know, having the platforms, the social media platforms, really seriously address, address this issue. Because in, in my view, social media you know, has been the force multiplier on terrorism and will be for the next few years. So we might as well start thinking now about you know, those difficult issues that Mike had raised uh, in their last session. So the UK has a um, few problems with homegrown terrorism, gro uh, grooming of, and, uh, and in particular in the corrections facilities yeah. um, with radicalizing you know, prisoners. How are you working with corrections officers to combat this radicalization within your corrections facilities? Okay, I mean, it's a good question. So um, obviously the success we've had in convicting terrorists means we've got a lot more in our prisons. So we've got over 120 convicted terrorists in our prisons. Uh, and that has created, as you've said, um, its own problems. So we've got a dilemma at the moment about whether we put them together, where they then plot uh, uh, terrorist attacks, um, or we separate them out and then they radicalize our gang nominals. And so it's that kind of catch-22. Um, I don't think that the UK has really got to grips with this issue yet. There's a, um, a new Secretary of State uh, for Justice looking at this very issue. There's been a report done which has acknowledged the seriousness of the problem. Um, there are other countries in the world, actually, that have dealt with this better than, than we have, um, even Indonesia, in fact, um, and, and other countries. Um, it's a real challenge for us uh, because uh, of those dilemmas. And many of the counterterrorism operations that we've started in the last two or three years have actually originated from prison. So you end up having to put intelligence capability and sources and build your intelligence coverage in prisons. You know, you thought you'd solve the problem by putting them away, but of course, it's not entirely true. That's a good question. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Commander Walton. Um, I'd like to invite our panelists and our moderator from panel three which is our last panel of the day, to please join me up on the stage. While our panelists are coming to their seats,